Hello and welcome back for another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. Jean Marie is not with us today. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we are talking with Jim Elliott. Jim is the president and founder of DiveHeart. DiveHeart is a nonprofit organization that provide scuba diving instruction, opportunities, and adventures to children, adults, and veterans with disabilities. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you guys for having me. I actually know Jim rather well. Um, I met him way back in 2003 at um, a professional event. Jim was an exhibitor with this really cool organization called Dive Heart that I knew nothing about. And... um, being a diver myself, I was very curious uh, about the organization, so uh, I started talking to him about it, and then he told me all about what Dive Heart is. Well, I met Jim actually through you. It's a great organization. We were uh, helping a couple of the vets out, and they were diving in our pool when we were in Oak Brook, and it is a great organization, and we thought, let's get Jim on the show and talk about the benefits of scuba. So, Jim, why don't you... Start us out, first of all, what is scuba, in case people don't know. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> well, way less than one percentage of the population of the world scuba dives, and um, way less than one percent of the dive industry does what we do. So what we do is very, 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 very unique. Oh. But scuba is an acronym, and it stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. And basically, the Navy, years ago, learned, uh, developed equipment um, to breathe underwater, a uh, tank and regulators and all that kind of stuff. And they, um, it allows you to, to be in inner space, uh, which is a zero-gravity environment, much like outer space, but a lot denser. And what we do with people with disabilities is take them in there and, and get them neutrally buoyant and give them the same experience that an, a- an astronaut would have only underwater, whether it's in a pool or it's, you know, in, in, in the open water environment. And we, it's really, what we do is, we call it scuba, but it's really not about scuba. It's about taking really the unrealized human potential in people with disabilities and creating a paradigm shift. Once we get them out of the wheelchair, get them in the water standing up, they look down, they go, oh my God, I'm standing up for the first time <laughs> right. since my injury. And right. they go, this is amazing. If I'm a, if I can dive, what else can I do? And then, um, they, they, we point them in the direction of marine biology, oceanography, make them good stewards of the environment. So it's really not about scuba, although scuba is a tool we use and mm-hmm. zero gravity is a tool we use. It's also pretty cool to say that you're one of 1% of the people that dive and the other 99% don't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it is cool. I mean, when you roll into a party in a wheelchair and people go, what have you been doing lately, Ron? And, they, and you go, oh, yeah, I was diving. And they go, yeah, sure you were. And then you show them your Facebook page, right? There are mm-hmm. pictures on your phone. Mm-hmm. And it's like all of a sudden you got bragging rights. And people are like, oh, dude, Ron dives. You know, so it, 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 it's very good for your confidence, independence, and self-esteem. Right, and that's right up the alley for Lita and me. That's where we actually met was in grad school. Uh, when we were learning about therapeutic recreation and that's one of the things that intrigued me from the very get-go when you and I first met about the intrinsic benefits that people would receive from uh, participating in the sport. So, I mean, it was a win-win. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So, so, Jim, when did you first start diving? What do you like most about the sport? Well, it's um, it, I look at it differently than a lot of people. A lot of people call it a sport. I don't look at it as a sport at all, really. Sure. Um, I'm a journalist, so a trained journalist in college, and um, was recruited out of Northern Illinois University by the Tribune. Went to WGN, helped start up Seal TV, and um, I, I started diving in '76. And I started because I thought, as a journalist, if I meet someone like Jacques Cousteau. And a lot of people who are below 40, (laughs) younger than 40, may not know who Jacques Cousteau is, but he helped develop the self-contained underwater breathing apparatus equipment. And I thought, well, if I ever meet someone like that, I better know how to scuba dive. So it was just another arrow in my quiver (laughs) as a journalist. And I I tell you what, I fell in love with it, man. I got in the pool and I'm hovering in midwater going, this is amazing. This is like being an astronaut, right? This is going to lead into my next question because I know now the diving, obviously, that you do is a lot different. 
spot when you first got into diving, where was your favorite place to go? Or Because it was just recreational at that time. Yeah, when I first started diving, mm-hmm. I didn't care. I was I, t- I swear to God, I'd drive down the road, I'd see a, a puddle, and I'd go, <laughs> I want to dive that. That looks like a puddle. I could get in the water there. Seriously, I was diving stuff that now I would never get near. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I understand that. Um, yeah, forget the puddles. We're in bigger water now. Uh, let's start talking about Dive Heart. What led you to found the organization? Well, I've been blessed to be around people with disabilities my whole life. I My father was a, a disabled Army vet, so I spent a lot of time running around Heinz VA Hospital in Maywood, Illinois, dodging wheelchairs and stuff, right? And then as I got older, a good friend of mine had cerebral palsy. I was in his scouts with him, Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and stuff, and I I would I would walk him to school because the, the bullies would pick on him. And... and um, so that was, you know, the beginning. And then I married a lady with, with you know, with two boys and we had kids and, and my oldest daughter was born blind. So, and the other kids had different types of, of disabilities, if you will. And when my blind daughter started struggling with being blind, then I got her involved in a downhill ski group called the American Blind Skiing Foundation. And there, we we went out and I didn't know what to expect and I you know I started I had skied for a while so I, I, I learned how to teach I learned how to guide and then I, I started training instructors and different people to to guide blind skiers but I started seeing amazing things happen on the ski hill people were building confidence independence and self-esteem right they were um, being able to going wow if I can ski what else can I do they're focusing on what they can do instead of what they can't do And I thought, wow, you know, if if skiing can do this, what can diving do, right? Because in skiing, you can only ski at certain times of the year, and you can only ski in certain places in the world. And I thought, but diving, all you need is a swimming pool. So I thought, gosh, you know, let's do this in diving, what I've been doing in skiing since the 80s. So that's kind of where the idea began. And it took really, I had decades to think about it and write notes and come up with business plans and things like that. But, you know, I, I at the end of the day, I walked away from a, a six-figure income, a successful career in the media business to basically become a volunteer. I don't draw a salary with Dive Heart and... Um, you know, and, and I don't know, I was thinking on the way here, if somebody said, if I would have said to somebody, hey, I have an idea, I want to <laughs> leave a successful media career and not draw a salary and help people with disabilities, you know, t- do scuba diving, I was thinking, what would they have said to me? What would my friends would have said to me? <laughs> they would have said, you're crazy. Yeah, I'm sure they would have, but now, I don't think so. No, right. <laughs> I started doing this in 97, right. so we're 22 years into teaching people with disabilities, right? Wow, that's incredible. That's a that's a good story. Jim, I'm just curious. You know, you were talking about people with uh, possibly physical limitations, like not being able to walk. Uh, I know that there were veterans um, at my pool, and some of those might have been PTSD. I'm not really sure. But are there certain medical conditions that would preclude somebody from diving? Well, right now there are. Uh, we, we have a policy where if you have active seizures, um, that it's, we can't take you underwater. And, uh, and really insurance dictates that. Um, it's an industry-wide standard. But it's a safety much. reason. It's right. a safety reason, right. If, you went, if I had you at 66 feet underwater, which is three atmospheres, and you began to seize, even if I had a full face mask on you where you wouldn't inhale water because you couldn't, right? Mm-hmm. If you're breathing with a seizure and you have a full face mask on, you're going to keep breathing. And I thought the full face mask was going to be the answer for seizures, to mm-hmm. be honest with you. Right. And then I didn't realize physiologically, and, and there are doctors at Duke and Northwestern and stuff, that pointed this out to me. They said, Jim, as you bring somebody up, the alveoli could trap air in this during a seizure in their lungs, and that could rupture on the way up because as you go up, air expands, mm-hmm. and, which is one of the things, which is the big rule in diving is never hold your breath, right? So that's that's honestly that and open wounds. You don't want to get in the, any water, obviously, with open wounds because of infection. But those are really the two big, th- I have, oh, blood-related pressure illnesses or any kind of pressure-related illness mm-hmm. is another thing that might keep you from diving. But 
we want to build a facility in warm water, like a deep water pool, where we can replicate what we see in open water and really start doing research mm -hmm. on epilepsy and some of the other you know, contraindications that keep you from diving. Right, but the, the people that want to dive, though, they got to go to their doctor, right? They've got to get the A-OK -okay or have the doctor say, we don't think you're fit to dive. And then if they have questions, they can... Uh, there's medical doctors out there who dive as well, right, who can answer questions. Absolutely. There's dive physicians that we send people to if they don't, if their physician says, oh, I don't think you should be doing this. Um, and it's really funny because sometimes people are you know, they might have just a spinal cord injury, right? And I, I don't mean just a spinal no, cord right, injury. Right. Well, let me interject but, there. I actually yeah. had a student who I wanted to get to dive, and he saw his physician, and I saw the physician write on his form, no, he does not want this student to dive because he's wheelchair-bound. Huh. Right, wheelchair-bound, right? That, I love that, that, that was the exact terminology, a and this was only term. 10 years ago. <laughs> wow. I know. Um, but... But there, there's physicians out there that who are also divers who understand that it's not necessarily the disability that will preclude somebody from diving. It has to be a medical condition, correct? Right. Safety is always first. And if we think there's a problem, there's a problem, and we won't take someone underwater. But we certainly would question a doctor who's, who just off, cuff, off the cuff says, oh, no, Ron can't dive because he's a below-the-knee amputee, and we're afraid. We don't know what happens to below-the-knee amputees underwater. To me, it's like you, you get in front of a, physician, a dive physician that knows what they're doing, mm -hmm. and, and the dive physician looks at that individual's medical background, and then they make the determination we don't, and right. that's not our job. Right, right. Well, um, I'm not sure if, if Ron talked talk to you about it, but we interviewed Travis Mills uh, a couple of weeks ago for a Veterans Day, and he is a quad amputee from the Iraq War. No, I guess it was Afghanistan. Afghanistan. And um, he would like to dive off of the coast of Africa with sharks. He wants to specifically, and not just dive, because he has gone diving since, he, since his injuries, but he wants to specifically go shark diving. So is that something that you would be able to, to, <laughs> to cover with him? We, we've done a lot of shark dives with okay. individuals with disabilities. All right. um, so off the south coast of Africa, I'm thinking you probably have great whites. So I'm thinking it's probably a cage diving situation. Yes, he did mention cave. Right. Cages. So in the Bahamas, right. we've done a lot of dives with, um, with sharks, uh, reef sharks, and all sorts of different types of sharks that, uh, you know, um, in open water. So okay. you're right, right there with them, yeah. Well, that aren't aggressive, that... Uh, well, it's a misnomer sharks, with people, but yeah, they're, they're all, all sharks are aggressive. But I mean, they're they're sharks. They're animals, right? So you got to be careful. Well, there's a poodle in a pit bull. They, well, yeah. The thing is, you, you hopefully go on a, a shark dive, and and this is a real controversial thing in the dive industry. Some people are really against it, and some people make their living off of it. Mm -hmm. And in the Bahamas, they do shark dives where they do a feeding, and they have people in chain mail that go right. down, and and it's very controlled. And they send you down first, and you get in a circle, and you're given instructions: don't put your hands out there, don't hold your camera way out in front of you. Mm -hmm. You know things that would because when when they're feeding the shark, they hold the food like out you know, on a spear or something you know and, and the shark when the shark sees an arm go out he and thinks, something's at the end of it yep he might think it's a it's a, it's a piece food. of grouper yeah right, right. right so but it's it's typically not i wouldn't want to say it's not dangerous but it's very 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 few people more people get hurt texting in a week walking across the street than do in a year on a shark dive okay all right and well, i don't know that that's true but i just <laughs> That sounds great. That well, sounds about right. Um, again, talking strictly about the the organization itself, it, um, it started out in Chicago, and we've got people in other parts of the country, and we've expanded. What other uh, parts of the world can you tell our listeners where we're at? Well, we our 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 ultimate goal is to grow and inspire adaptive scuba and scuba therapy around the world. So we've done programs in China, Australia, Israel, the UK, all over the Caribbean, hundreds of cities in the US, uh, most recently Singapore, Philippines, uh, Malaysia. We have, a, we have a team in Malaysia that 
just is rocking and rolling. They just started another program in Borneo, and they're going to be going to a dive show in Australia for us. And I've trained in Melbourne, which is, you know, colder water in Australia, but I, they're going to go to Sydney and do this show. And, I mean, you know, because it's so few people dive, it's just a process getting the word out. Sure. How many individuals have you already um, taught or how many have gone through your program so far? Well, we, we teach people with disabilities. We call them adaptive divers. We don't call them handicapped or disabled. Okay. And we train buddies. So if you're a, an open water diver, advanced open water diver, or rescue diver, uh, you could become a dive buddy. And then if you become a certain level, a dive master or a rescue diver with certain certifications or an instructor, then you become an advanced buddy or an instructor. So we train all sorts of different levels in the adaptive realm and we've trained thousands all over the world since I started doing this. Okay, that's great. This is where my passion is at. Seeing the reaction of people, of our participants, when they actually complete their dive to, to just to see the look on their face and all that. What reactions have you seen or what feedback have you gotten from people that have done it for the first time. Well, what's interesting is we, we do research with university medical centers all over the country, and the Illinois School of Psychology, uh, one of their researchers um, interviewed a whole bunch of our, our participants, kids, adults, vets, and they f said, Jim, you're not going to believe this. The first pool session in a lot of, a lot of ways is the most powerful <laughs> because it creates that paradigm shift. Imagine you've never been in the water on scuba. You're putting a regulator in your mouth. You have a mask on your face. You stick your head underwater and you take a breath. Now your brain is going, what are you doing? You can't breathe underwater. And, and you really, some people like come up and they're like weirded out by it, right? They're like, oh my God, I, what a, this is weird. I can't do this. Your whole life you've been told when you go underwater, right. hold, hold your, your breath. breath. Now right, we're telling right. you, don't hold your breath. <laughs> right, it'd be like if you were like, you could stick your hand in fire and not get burnt, right? You know, like the Game of Thrones lady, whatever her name is. <laughs> I mean, that that's what it's like. It's like you stick your face in the water, you breathe, and it, you you have to wrap your head around it once. And and people jump up and they're freaked out, and I just kind of laugh. I go, yeah, you know what? It's not natural. Your brain's going, what are you doing? And once you kind of put it in perspective, use a little humor, people go, oh yeah, I guess, you know. And and then they see everybody else doing it, and then they go. Mm -hmm. Well, if Johnny with no arms and no legs can do it, I, I should be able to do this. So Now, are there risks involved? What should people know, the, the participants? How about kids, uh, the families of kids that want to try scuba? Well, when you're saying kids, are kids allowed to scuba? Uh, Ten is the youngest we can certify someone. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But uh, I'm sure there's some risks involved. What are they, and how do you calm the fears of parents? We are underwater. On life support so so when you look at it that way there's a whole lot of stuff that could go sideways but with the training that we give to our instructors and our dive buddies and in our you know it we really keep people safe I mean a quadriplegic like you were just amputee that you were just describing Travis mm -hmm. he would have three people in the water with him very highly trained and they would be right there for him if he spit out a regulator it would be out of his mouth two seconds not even, and it would be back in his mouth, and we would be assessing whether he was, you know, choking on water or he was, could be, he had to be brought to the surface or whatever. But nine, but we we train him in a pool, and they do tons of stuff in a pool before they ever ever get in open water. So, okay. saying that, it is it is dangerous in a way because you are you know you're in an environment that's foreign. The other thing is, um, people with disabilities are way better suited in many ways than able-bodied people to dive because what they do every day is daunting. Getting out of bed as a quad, going to the bathroom with a bowel program. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't deal with that as able-bodied folks. So, right. you know, so they're prepared mentally. The one thing that I do want to add to that though with, with the families, and, and, and I can attest to this numerous times, you'll have parents be a little bit freaked out but when they see their child come out of the water, grinning from ear to ear, you, you look at the parents again and they are just so relieved and so excited that their, their child, their son or daughter has found something that they really enjoy. Yeah, I've had parents cry. Go ahead, Lita. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I'm sure it's similar to when you're taking your child to ride a bike for the first time and you're running alongside and you're holding onto the seat and you let go 
and you kind of you're, you're cringing because you're thinking oh my gosh they could fall but then as soon as you see that they can handle it because you've already gone over the balance and the and the tips with them now you see that they're pedaling on their own and you have nothing but admiration for what they're doing they're accomplishing something that they didn't do the day before yeah and the cool thing is um to watch a parent with tears in their eyes say i didn't think jane was going to get in the water much less go underwater mm-hmm. and try this uh, we had a, a wife of a, a marine vet who had um, a grenade had blown off part of his face and we put a full face mask on him with surgical tubing to conform to the to the part of his face that was not uh, fitting in the mask and he went underwater and he didn't come up until the tank was almost empty we had to kind of <laughs> like go dude you're coming up yeah. and the wife was crying on the side saying this is the first time he's been out of the house since his injury and he just he loved it it was amazing and again as a rec therapist what that does for the person it just increases their self-esteem and then they they do more right so as you said it's a tool it's not the be-all end-all but it's a tool it's an incredible tool but it's a tool for people to empower themselves yeah we you know one of your students robert right Mm -hmm. robert at 10 uh, bullies took him on a playground turned him upside down and drove his head into the concrete he suffered a c5 spinal cord injury it was incomplete so he had a little bit of movement in his legs some in the arm and we had him in, I have a video that's unbelievable. It's on our YouTube channel. He was standing erect at the bottom of the ocean. Well, yeah, I got the current behind him so it would push him forward. And then he got, we got him weighted properly. And then he used his breath to control his buoyancy. And he ran literally for eight minutes across the bottom of the ocean wow. with three instructors kind of poised to help him. But they didn't need to. When he looked like he was going to fall down, he took a breath in and came up. When he When he took in a big breath he looked like Mm -hmm. he was going to lose control of his buoyancy he would exhale and come down but i said show this to your therapist show this to your physical and occupational therapist your rehab docs because this is going to revolutionize rehabilitation Mm -hmm. when we build this facility that sounds wonderful Uh, speaking of equipment is there a lot of equipment that that is needed for uh the scuba most of uh, equipment is standard for people with disabilities. We like to use jacket style buoyancy compensators, which is a vest that goes on and we can put weights in it. So it trims, trims, you, out, trims you out a little bit. And then we use ankle weights and clip on weights to put on different parts of your body to, uh, to like if you have a, like Tammy Duckworth, we got her in the water first time after she was shot down in Iraq. And who's Tammy Duckworth? Our uh, Illinois Senator. Yeah. Um, U.S. Senator. Uh, she was, uh, was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot, mm-hmm. lost her right leg at the hip, left leg at the knee in Iraq, one of the first females injured right. there. And we got her in the water, and we had to do some really cool wading stuff with her where we had to take her wetsuit and fold it back up over her, her, her left leg and duct tape it. And then we had to put an ankle weight in there, and we had clip-on weights on her, and we got her trimmed out well. And then she was able to control her buoyancy just by using her breath. And that's what we try to do is spend a lot of time to get that right. Uh, I didn't realize that you had uh, Senator Duckworth in the, was that in a pool or was that an open water dive? No, that was in a pool. We're hoping to get her on an open water dive. She's been invited to several of our veterans dives and uh, obviously, you know, being a, a little busy these days. A little busy these days. <laughs> uh, but I think at some point down the road, she she may join us and I um you know we're she's a big supporter though and and uh, helps us uh get things done well that's great and uh what type of training would a person have to go through in order to participate well we start out people in what we call a dive heart scuba experience so once the paperwork is all squared away and the doctors sign off then we get them in a pool and we basically teach them how to breathe how to wrap their head around the whole idea of putting their face underwater and breathing teach them how to use their breathing so they can control their buoyancy, teach them how to recover a regulator if they're able to, teach them how to clear a mask if they're able to, and then basically tell them what we're going to do uh, in shallow water and swim around shallow water for a while. And once they get comfortable, then we prepare them for maybe a 10-foot dive in deeper, the deeper part of the pool or 14 foot dive and then we we get them there and we try to my goal is always to get them neutrally buoyant so they're hovering without any of us holding on to them using all they're independent okay they may be in a wheelchair all day long 
but now they're independent and they use what abilities. So if, if you can only move your left arm, we try to teach them how to use their left arm effectively to move through the water the way they want to move through the water using their breath and, and whatever abilities they have. So we don't focus on disabilities. We focus on abilities. Well, that's good. What would you say was your most memorable experience with a participant on a dive? Well, that was actually not in open water. That was in a pool with a diver we have who has cerebral palsy. Her name is Erin. And we were in a, I was only in like four or five, probably five feet of water because I was standing up with my head above water with a mask on. But I was holding her underwater with a full face mask Mm -hmm. and a full scuba kit. And we were in a big pool, and there was a a lane line. And on one side of the lane line, we were doing our scuba experience program. And on the other side, there was a birthday party with young girls. So all these young girls with their little goggles on were looking at Aaron. They're like, oh, my God. There's this, like, I mean, here's Aaron with CP. You know, her hands are bumped up. She's got all the gear on. She has a full face mask on. She looks like like an astronaut, right, from outer (laughs) space. So they, you could tell they're looking at her like, oh my God, what's going on? And, and Aaron's looking at them underwater. So they pop up out of the water. And I said, hey guys, Aaron thinks you're mermaids. <laughs> Come on over here. And they like got a look on their face. It created an identity shift. All of a sudden they were mermaids. They went, oh my God, we're mermaids. And they swam over, I swear to God, like mermaids. They swam over and then they got near Aaron. And Aaron reached out with her hand who was you know, impaired because of cerebral palsy. Mm-hmm. And they they kind of wanted to reach out and touch her hand, but they didn't know if it was okay and because they hadn't been around people with disabilities. So when they popped up again, I said, it's okay. She wants to give you like a fist bump. Right. So you guys can fist bump her. Right, right. So then they went back down and now they're all fist bumping Aaron and she's like getting all excited. And then they, they had to go back to their party, right? Yeah. And then we come back to the, the side of the pool and I, I take off Aaron's mask and I go, Aaron, I go, did you see those mermaids underwater? Oh my <laughs> God, they would have came over, they were fist bumping <laughs> you. And then Aaron looked up at her parents and said, you know, we took the mask off and she's like, I saw a mermaid. <laughs> I'm so blown away. That's great. Yeah, that's great. That was a, that was really a big thing. Oh, I'm sure. And then the one with Robert, of course, that was hard to. Manage. And, and I'm actually honestly surprised that you can pinpoint because we've talked about this before, and you give me that look like, dude, there's been so many moments. It's hard to choose one, uh, but you were spot on right now. So that was really must have been really impactful. It was right. Anything that touches your heart that way. Are there any online resources for people that might be interested in diving uh, in general? Yeah, what I would what I would recommend doing is if you want to see this in action, is if you go to diveheart.org, click on the media tab, top right hand side of the page, you'll see a media kit which has NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams, PBS did a documentary, my one of the two TED talks I did is there, plus tons of other stories, all the networks, then right below the media kit is recent media. You'll see what we're doing around the world. Malaysia, Borneo, all over the place. And then there's there's our YouTube channel, which has a bunch of videos from our, uh, next year will be our 11th Adaptive Scuba Symposium. And and you, you'll get information that you'll never get anywhere else in the world from those, those Great. resources. Great, we'll make sure that we put those on our website for everybody to find. One more question. What would you like to see for the future of scuba um, as a recreation therapy tool? Again, we, we've talked about how uh, for the self-esteem, and, and it's great, but uh, I, I know you're and looking at something. range of motion. Right. No, well, I, I know we're right. looking at some other things, too. Um, again, the range of motion, and we, we talked earlier do you want to talk a little bit more about like the the pain management, or where would you like to see it go? Sure. Well, I you know I think with the facility, you know, we've already changed the dive industry. I mean, you know, none of the major training agencies wanted anything to do with adaptive scuba because number one, it didn't pay. Number two, it was a lot of work, and number three they were afraid of the liability, right? Mm-hmm. And we just plowed into it and, and changed the industry because when they see, start seeing you on PBS doing documentaries mm-hmm. and NBC doing stuff, they're going, what is Dive Heart doing that we should be doing? And what we did is we just drove the industry, you know, kicking and screaming into adaptive scuba. And now all of the dive 
training agencies have some form of adaptive program. Now, a lot of them don't really have a handle on it very well, so be careful, but but we have changed the industry. But what we, want, what we know now is we did the first study with Midwestern University on autism and scuba therapy. Uh, if you have, and autism is an epidemic, as we all know, right? Pressure is a therapy for kids with autism. Mm -hmm. When we get them underwater, it eliminates surface distractions, helps them focus, they come out with mm -hmm. a new identity. That's powerful. If we get you deep enough, we know that it helps with chronic pain. People with 10, 15 years of chronic pain, if we get you deep enough, there's an extra output of serotonin, which helps with pain management and PTSD symptoms. Um, pilot studies have shown that you, know, you can be pain-free for three weeks. If you if you get deep enough uh, on a trip like the Cozumel trip we normally do, mm -hmm. we go down deep five times. Right. Yeah, and then the facility we want to replicate that so we can do all sorts of research. To me, I think we're at the very tip of the iceberg. I want to revolutionize rehabilitation uh, with what we want to do. Well, again, with uh, some of these things that we were talking about in the medical community, when they see that what this is doing, and they start actually doing studies and, and, and have medical documentation, then I think um, it, it's going to go... It'll validate it. it I mean, know, that's a great way of putting it. Absolutely. It will validate what right. we're saying is happening. Right. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, we've done, we've done programs with university medical centers and research all over the country. We're doing one now with Midwestern University. It's a quality of life, kind of a, you know, more of an interview type of thing. Mm -hmm. We didn't do blood draws or any of that stuff, but that's in the future. I mean... In the facility we want to build, imagine being able to go underwater and you're in zero gravity and you're working on range of motion and you're working at, you're getting better circulation yeah, and all sorts of stuff. But then imagine introducing enriched air. So now you're on 50% O2 oxygen or 100% oxygen. Now imagine what that does for the oxygenation of your tissue. And I'm not a doctor or a therapist, but to me intuitively and what I've seen, it's going to help. And then then you introduce pharmaceuticals potentially. I mean, you know, all of a sudden you're going, well, we know what your drug does at one atmosphere. What does it do at two mm -hmm. atmospheres on 50% O2? And now you start seeing dramatic changes. And, and you need researchers to do this. I mean, the facility we want to build will be a destination for researchers from all over the world. We'll keep them safe. We'll train them how to dive, whatever needs to be done. They're going to be the ones that gets the, the IRBs, which you have to get th to do the actual mm -hmm. research on humans. Mm -hmm. They get the IRBs. They're the ones that do the blood draws. They're the ones that do the research and the documentation. But it's coming. It sounds like it. I think it's it's a a challenge that you're ready for. I don't think I don't think anything's going to hold you down. Perseverance, right? It's like water. <laughs> yes, it finds its way. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining our show today, Jim. I hope that uh, more people out there are going to have a chance to participate based on this episode. Uh, I know that you mentioned quite a few countries that were listened to, but there's a couple that you missed. We've got some friends in Norway and Sweden. I hope they can join your ranks in the future. Yeah, we have a, we have a just uh, certified instructor this year in Cozumel from Munich. He uh, I trained him years That's right. ago. That's right. And now he's a, we're hoping he'll become. We have a guy in, in Malaysia, Saeed, who's mm -hmm. a rock star. We're hoping that yes. Klaus becomes a rock star in Europe. That's great. Hey, one of the things we forgot to mention: How can we get a hold of you? How can we get a hold of Diveheart? It's uh, diveheart.org is our is our website, and okay. uh, you know we're based in Downers Grove, Illinois. And if you Google it. You'll, you'll get our number. If you call the number, it goes right to me, and I will forward it to a training instruct, you know, one of our training coordinators or a, a doctor or a therapist, whatever needs to be done. Or we'll get you into the volunteer program. Um, if you want to donate, we are, we're always, I mean, we're volunteer driven. I don't draw a salary, so um, the money doesn't go to me. <laughs> well, thank you. And if our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new health care regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it 
because of something you have heard on this podcast. Till next week. Bye.